The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being patient with us this evening. I'm Kim Bischoff, the Executive Director of the NF Network, and we would like to welcome you to our webinar series. Tonight, we have 35 people registered from across the country to participate. These webinars have proven to be an excellent way for the NF Network to reach individuals across the country. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Scott Plotkins with us to share his expertise in schwannomatosis. He is the director of the Neurofibromatosis Clinic within the Department of Neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's been the director since 2005 and is a member of the Massachusetts General Brain Tumor Center. He is active in educating medical professionals inside and outside of Massachusetts General about NF, and the NF Network is excited to have him present for us this evening. The talk will focus on schwannomatosis. After Dr. Plotkin's talk, we will have time for question and answers. There is a box at the right in the webinar control panel which will allow you to type in questions. We will read and take a few questions as time permits after the webinar. There's a little bit of instructions I'd like to give you. There's two different ways you can ask. One is to write a question to be read aloud to Dr. Plotkins. You click on the chat or the question box located in the lower portion of the webinar control panel. Or you can ask him a question verbally. You click the green hand icon in the control panel, panel and that indicates that you have a question. Your name will be called and then your phone will be activated. To remove that webinar control panel so that you can see the full screen, click on the orange rectangular button at the top left portion of the panel. And now I would like to introduce to you Dr. Scott Plotkins. Are you there, Dr. Plotkins? I certainly am. Thank you so much, Kim. I really appreciate the introduction. I apologize. Can you hear me, first of all? Yes, I can. Can you, can you see my screen? Well, I'm getting ready to do that. Here we'll oh, okay. Go right now. You say when. It's coming now. Okay, I'm starting to see it. Can you see it yet? Yes, we can. Now, I can't see your little sidebar, though. Hmm. Do I have to see the sidebar with the, with the webinar data on it? Nope, you'll be just fine okay. the way it is. Just go ahead and go through the slides as normal. Okay, well, thank you so much for the kind introduction for allowing me to give the webinar today. I apologize to everyone for being late. I was the holdup trying to finish up things, so... Uh, I hope uh, it meets your expectations. Um, I wanted to give an, a, a, an update and an overview of schwannomatosis, which is such a, a deep interest of all of us at Mass General Hospital, so it, it's great to have the opportunity to do this. Just one or quick, two quick slides about the Family Center for Neurofibromatosis at NF. It's a multi at MGH. It's a multidisciplinary clinic for patients. Um, and we have a group of dedicated NF specialists in every field. Um, I'm not exactly sure how many patients we're actively following now, probably more than 50, although we have, um, have seen probably almost 100 or more at, uh, at MGH. And we really focus a lot on quality of life for our patients with a focus on pain management, surgery, managing depression and anxiety, and talking to patients about family planning. And this is the model that we have there uh, at MGH with the Family Center uh, acting as a referral to specialists throughout the hospital to uh, assist patients in really all aspects of care. So I wanted to start off by very briefly reviewing the clinical features of NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. And, and the reason I do this is because sometimes we get confused about the difference uh, about the three forms of uh, NF. And so it's probably just helpful um, to quickly compare and contrast them. So neurofibromatosis type 1 um, is caused by germline mutations in the NF1 tumor suppressor gene. That is, people who are born with it, we think it affects about 80 to 100,000 Americans. It's autosomal dominant with full penetrance. Autosomal dominant means that <clears throat> if you have NF1, uh, about half of all children uh, would be expected to have NF1. Full penetrance means that individuals who, have, who inherit the genetic alteration do show signs of the condition. In NF1, a 
Diagnosis is typically made before age 10, and it often includes calf early macules and skin fold freckling, which I'll show you on the next page, um, or uh, cutaneous, which means skin or deep neurofibromas in adults. And if you look here at some of the tumor manifestations in NF1, uh, on the left, you can see an example of a whole body MRI showing tumor distributed throughout the body in a patient with NF1. You can get these plexiform neurofibromas that can affect the chest down the arm. You can have gliomas or brain tumors which affect the brain stem or other parts of the brain, such as the optic pathway. Cutaneous neurofibromas are a big problem in NF1, as are the malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors or the cancerous form of neurofibromas. And finally, patients can also get benign uh, hormone-secreting tumors called pheochromocytomas. And NF type 2 <clears throat> is caused by germline mutations, the NF2 tumor suppressor gene. That is, you're born with these. That's what germline means. I think it's about 1 in 25,000 individuals, uh, probably somewhere between 10 and 15,000 Americans, like NF1. NF2 is characterized by an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, so 50% of offspring of children uh, would be uh, expected to have NF2, and again, full penetrance such that <clears throat> if you inherit the NF2 gene change, you're expected to show signs. In contrast to NF1, where the average age of onset is 10, uh, before the age of 10 of symptoms, uh, in NF2, the average onset of symptoms is around 22. And the typical presentation includes hearing loss, tinnitus, which is uh, hearing sounds that aren't present in the environment or imbalance in adults, and skin tumors, eye findings, and seizures in children. And here's a, an, uh, a slide of the different types of tumors that we see in NF2. Here, um, you, again, you can see tumor um, distributed throughout the body, in this case not neurofibromas but schwannomas. <clears throat> and you can see this is an MRI scan showing multiple spinal schwannomas at different levels. Of course, the, this is the, the, the bony spine here, and this is the spinal cord where these tumors are. You can see the tumor growing out of the spine here to compress some of the tissues beneath. This is a schwannoma uh, at the base of the skull. This is one of the skin schwannomas. Here are the characteristic bilateral vestibular schwannomas that characterizes NF2. And here's another tumor called a spinal ependymoma. And finally, which, and here it's at the connection of the brain to the spine. And then finally, meningiomas, which are benign tumors of the covering of the brain, um, also present in NF type 2. And just a, a brief uh, word about schwannomatosis, and we're going to discuss this in more detail, to, um, but to give contrast to NF1 and NF2, it's a third form of NF that's recently been characterized. <clears throat> in contrast to NF1 and NF2, where the genes were named for it, um, were named for the conditions, um, we know that for schwannomatosis, the INI1 or SMARTB1 gene um, is responsible for a minority of patients having schwannomatosis. I'll give you some information about how common schwannomatosis is. We think it's about the same as NF2. And really, in contrast to um, NF1 and NF2, um, where 50% of patients have a family history, um, only 15% have a family history in schwannomatosis. And unlike NF1 and NF2, where if you inherit the gene, you always show signs of the condition, in schwannomatosis, you can inherit the gene and have absolutely no science. We call that incomplete penetrance. The other way to think about incomplete penetrance is that it can skip a generation. Um, the average age of diagnosis is later even than NF2 in the third and fourth decade. And unlike the other conditions, patients usually present with either uh, pain or a mass. Sorry about that little mistake there. And the tumors that we see in schwannomatosis are schwannomas. Primarily, I'll tell you about some other tumor types in a second. Um, you can see here on the left calf and on the right calf, two typical appearing schwannomas. And this is an image of the spine. These are the spine bones. So that's a bone, disc, bone, disc. This is the spine itself. Each of these little dots is a small schwannoma tumor, as you can see here. Okay. 
So let's go back in time and learn more about schwannomatosis, um, and we're going to talk how we delineated schwannoma, schwannomatosis from NF2, because for many years these two conditions have been thought to be the same thing. I'll tell you a little bit about the prevalence or how common schwannomatosis is, and at the risk of sounding too scientific or, or, or really going into too much detail, I will tell you a little bit about the molecular biology of what's happening in these tumors, and um, it may be of interest to some people, perhaps not others. And then um, finally talk a little bit about this, how common these gene changes are in patients with schwannomatosis. So if we think of a historical timeline for schwannomatosis, it's always good to remember that NF2 was described back in 1822 by Dr. Wishart in, uh, in um, I think, Scotland. It wasn't until 1881 that von Recklinghausen described NF1. So both of these conditions have been described for many years. And schwannomatosis is only first described in 1984. And that's some of the reason why we know so much less about schwannomatosis than we do about these other two conditions. In 1990, the gene responsible for NF1 was identified. In 1993, the gene for NF2 was identified, actually here, at least in part, at MGH. But it wasn't until 2007 that one of the genes involved in familial schwannomatosis was identified. And so this gives you a little bit of perspective on how things have been slightly different for the three forms of NF. Now, I mentioned that schwannomatosis was really first described in 1984, and the credit to this goes to a Japanese a uh, group of doctors, including Dr. Niimura, who's the second author here, when they first described patients who had multiple cutaneous, which means skin, neurilemomas is an old name for schwannomas. And you can see here on the bottom line that from the findings presented here, neurilemomatosis, which is what we would call schwannomatosis, is a clinical identity clearly distinguished from the neurofibromatosis of von Recklinghausen's disease. And this was the first time that we began to see um, splitting of these different conditions. But it should be noted that in these early attempts to um, come to terms with the, this very unique patient population, that um, the team was actually including some patients with NF2 and some patients with schwannomatosis. And you can see that because about half of the patients actually had vestibular schwannomas. And of note, these patients were young, and, and um, that was important in terms of uh, identifying the condition. So in 1996, 12 years later, my boss, Mia McCollin, published an important paper that further refined um, how we thought about patients with schwannomatosis. And in order to do so, she looked at patients who had multiple pathologically proven schwannomas, who, and these patients were, by definition, without vestibular schwannomas. And she showed that none of these patients had skin schwannomas, which was different than NF2 patients, that these patients tended to have pain without much neurologic disability, meaning not much weakness, numbness, tingling, and so forth, and no, and no hearing loss. And when you look carefully that these patients didn't have clinical manifestations of either NF1 or NF2, and that unlike um, what you would expect for NF1 or NF2 when a family history should be present in about half of patients, in this case it was only 1 in 14. And so she concluded at the time that these, um, this collection of, of, um, of uh, facts supported the idea that this was somehow a distinct entity uh, from NF2 in particular, but also from NF1. The problem was is that um, there was still a lot of overlap uh, in term, uh, with NF2, and this led to diagnostic um, confusion. That is, when you saw a patient, did they have NF2, did they have schwannomatosis? And here's an example of a paper that was published in 1997 of patients with um, spinal and cutaneous schwannomas. Um, and this paper was arguing that this was a variant form of NF type 2 and, and went on to look at six families who had uh, it, it, for, uh, seven patients from six families. And at the end of the paper, there was two competing hypotheses that were presented. One, that schwannomatosis was uh, some form of sporadic NF2 in young patients, meaning sporadic NF2 is when you're the first person in your family. So this was a form uh, uh, of NF2 that was... Um, not familial, or that it was some form of mosaic NF2, which 
which is a form of NF2 in which only part of the body is affected and therefore you don't have all the features of typical NF2. So even though in 1996 papers came out saying that these were distinct, there was still a lot of confusion in the field. <clears throat> By 2003, it was becoming increasingly clear that these were distinct um, conditions. And one of the ways that this was shown was by um, working with families who were affected by schwannomatosis. And this was a paper by Mia McCollin in which she looked at families and really said that they could not have NF2 because they did not have NF2 gene changes. And so if you look at the data here, LOH is looking at loss of copies of the NF2 gene and linkage analysis is looking how people in a, in a, in a single family how their genes are divided between, let's say, the mother's side and the father's side. And you can use these two techniques to try to identify what part of the, gen of the genes are affected. And when you did that, when they looked at um, 20 of 28 tumors, first they saw that they did have NF2 gene mutations, but importantly, none of these mutations or changes were found in the blood. And probably most importantly, when you looked at people who had schwannomatosis from two of these families, they didn't share a common NF2 region signature. That is, they didn't have that same structure there. And that disproved the idea that genetically disproved. We talked about clinically, but now we're talking genetically disproved the idea that, um, that a familial schwannomatosis was a form of NF2. Well, this led uh, two years later to uh, the development of consensus clinical guidelines. This was on at a meeting sponsored by the Children's Tumor Foundation where uh, uh, researchers from around the world came together and reviewed current data and proposed clinical criteria. I've listed them here on the left under table two really um, to show how complicated they are. They did um, classify people into definite and, pro and possible schwannomatosis with a subcategory of segmental. It's really not worth the effort of going through the details, but I think the important thing is that researchers were attempting to identify patients clinically who did not have NF2. Even though we've had consensus guidelines, there was still some problems with them. Uh, again, due to the overlap in symptoms between these conditions, and, and the year afterwards, a case of multiple cutaneous schwannomas was presented, and you can see here, on the cranial MRI scan, a tumor, this is probably a fifth nerve tumor, a trigeminal tumor. This is one in the hand. You can see others in the hand here. It turned out that although this patient did meet technically the clinical criteria from 2005, when you did the molecular analysis, this patient had a form of NF2. And so despite the best efforts of the community to come together to make foolproof criteria, <clears throat> it was clear that they still weren't perfect. Even more confusing <clears throat> is some data that's come out recently suggesting that vestibular schwannomas, which traditionally have never been allowed um, to occur in patients with schwannomatosis, meaning if you had a vestibular schwannoma, you couldn't meet clinical criteria. There's now been at least one group that's presented data suggesting that they can occur in schwannomatosis and should not be considered an exclusion criteria for the diagnosis. And so my own personal sense um, is that whether, patient, whether patients with schwannomatosis can have vestibular schwannoma is really controversial um, and really is an area of active interest among the researchers. So how do I think about schwannomatosis in general terms? If I wasn't going to um, uh, burden people with all the formal definitions, I would say that as of you know, earlier this year, I consider it a predisposition for multiple non-vestibular, so that means tumors not affecting the vestibular nerves, non-intradermal, so not in the skin schwannomas. Um, and you can see here examples of a patient who has a right neck tumor, and uh, a left shoulder tumor, and a left pectoral tumor right there. Three tumors, no vestibular schwannomas, and this is the, a patient who would have schwannomatosis. Well, one question I get a lot is how common is schwannomatosis? And unfortunately, the data we have is pretty limited. This is what the, the one bit of data we use to tell people that we think it's about as common as NF2. And the data comes from a population-based study of sporadic and NF2, um, uh, NF type 2 <coughs> um, meningiomas and schwannomas. This was um, 
out of Finland and they used a tumor registry and they looked at pathologically proven schwannomas. And as you can see here, 12 of the 455 individuals um, with these schwannomas had NF2 and 11 of 455 had schwannomatosis. And so this is what we use as being an indirect way of saying that they're roughly equal in prevalence. We know from some of the work uh, from Gareth Evans and the team in England that NF2 occurs about 1 in 25,000 to 1 in 40,000 individuals, and so we've used by extrapolation the number to be about the same for schwannomatosis. So now just a couple words about the molecular biology of schwannomas and schwannomatosis, and, and if, I, if I bore people here, I apologize in advance. It's, it's an area that's really interesting, um, and some may find it uh, helpful to talk about. One of the big questions that I get is why do patients with schwannomatosis get so many tumors? And this cartoon helps explain what um, ge uh, genetic events lead to tumor formation. And this cartoon, there's an upper panel and then there's a lower panel. And if you think about genetically normal individuals who don't have any underlying tumor condition, um, we know that there's a pool of susceptible cells, that's any cell in your body. And we know, of course, that um, every cell in the body has two copies of every gene, one you get from your mother and one you get from your father. So random genetic events occur in which the normal copy can be um, uh, damaged. And if you have one random genetic event, here you get a cell with uh, one copy that is um, uh, inactivated or doesn't work. You need a second random genetic event in the same cell to knock out both copies of the tumor suppressor gene and that leads to formation of a tumor. And you can imagine with all the cells in your body, to have two genetic events in the same cell is unlikely, and that's why these tumors are uncommon in most patients. However, if you're born with some type of familial tumor syndrome, such that you're born with one copy that does not work normally, when you do have random genetic events, you can see that each random genetic event serves to inactivate the second copy, and so you can get multiple tumors in, in, uh, multiple tumors develop in this setting. And so because uh, we think that patients with schwannomatosis have a familial tumor syndrome, um, and I'll tell you more about the genes, we think that's why they get so many tumors. So <clears throat> The first thing is we knew that these tumors um, that, that these tumors were occurring in patients who had um, symptoms similar to NF2. So the first place to look was at the NF2 gene. Um, and back in 1997, uh, the team at MGH looked at the NF2 gene in patients with schwannomatosis, including 20 patients uh, and five who had a family history. And if you looked in the 20 tumors. 10 of them did have abnormalities in the NF2 gene, and the second copy was lost in 70% of tumors. And so you say to yourself, well, why isn't this NF2? And the reason was because there were no common NF2 gene changes. And if we come back to this picture here, there was no common NF2 change that people were born with. We were just seeing lots of the events here um, in the, the, the first hit and the second hit here in the NF2 gene. And we found out through that study that there was one patient with mosaic NF2 confirming how difficult it is to separate between NF2 and, schwa and schwannomatosis. And so the, the upshot of this study was that there was a different pattern of NF2 gene changes in schwannomatosis tumors than there was in NF2 patients. And so it turned out that each, each tumor had a different gene change. And very quickly, if you look here at a patient who has, here's tumor one and here's, uh, they have a tumor one and a tumor two. Tumor one had, a, had a, a seven base pair deletion in the NF2 gene. So that's a very specific genetic change and a completely separate genetic change in tumor two, suggesting that they don't share that common genetic alteration. Uh, and when you looked at the blood, there was no common NF2 gene change. Again, confirming that study I just mentioned that each tumor had NF2 gene changes, but there was no common one throughout the body. So if it wasn't the NF2 gene that was ca causing schwannomatosis, what was it? And so for years people have looked to see what that was, and in 2007 a group uh, in Europe 
uh, in fact, narrowed it down to a gene called either INI1 or SMARCB1. It's the same gene, and looked at this gene uh, in the it looked at the DNA of a daughter and a father who both had schwannomatosis, and this group identified a shared genetic alteration in the father and daughter, and there was no NF2 mutation. And so this really confirmed for the first time a new gene that people are, were born with in familial schwannomatosis that, that was the cause of uh, schwannomatosis. Before I go on, uh, Kim, is it easy to see if people have questions about that in case we lose them, or should I just wait to the end? I don't have any questions typed in at this point, so we can go address it at the end. Okay. So we know at this point, I've told you that each of the, the tumors have NF2 gene changes, but there's no common NF2 gene change. And the second piece of information I've given you is that we have now identified a, 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 um, a gene called SMARCB1 that people are born with in some cases. So there's at least two genes that are uh, involved in schwannomatosis. So it turns out that the data now suggests that it takes either three genetic abnormalities or four genetic abnormalities in a tumor um, to actually cause a tumor to grow. And, and it, it's, a, it's cooperation between these two genes, including SMARCB1 and NF2. And I won't go into the details now, but um, what I find so fascinating is clinically we see a lot of overlap between NF2 and schwannomatosis when we try to separate patients out. And now on a genetic basis, you can see how complicated it is where there are NF2 gene changes and SMARCB1 gene changes. And so the overlap between these two conditions is quite, uh, is quite significant. So uh, understanding that um, the team in, uh, in uh, Manchester um, decided to look in the blood of patients to see how common is this gene change. It had been identified in a single family of a father, an affected father and affected daughter. Well, how common was it in, in the team um, in Manchester? And when they looked um, at, in the blood of these families and patients, about 7% of patients who, uh, with schwannomatosis who didn't have a family history ended up having this specific gene change, and about 30% of families with schwannomatosis had it. Um, so when you looked at all of the data together, you could combine the Italian experience, the, uh, the UK experience, and the MGH experience. Um, at least early on, we thought that about half of the families would have a, a genetic alteration in SMARCB1, and about 6% of patients without a family history. When you look now in 2012, those numbers are pretty similar, 45% and 7%. So when you, when you think about identifying a genetic change um, in somebody's blood, these are the numbers we typically quote, that if, if patients are from a family affected by NF, by, I'm sorry, affected by schwannomatosis, about half will be found to have a genetic alteration in SMARCB1, and less than 10% of patients without a family history will have this genetic change. Now, we've been focusing a lot on schwannomas, um, and for good reason, because it is the tumor that defines this condition. However, one thing um, that, was er that was identified even in 1996, that very first paper, I, the second paper I showed you, identified at least one patient that had a meningioma in addition to schwannomas, more recently, uh, in 2010, um, a group uh, from Italy um, identified patients who did have meningiomas uh, in the setting of schwannomatosis. And that, as I mentioned, these are benign tumors of the meninges, or the covering of the brain. And so this paper confirmed what had first been identified in 1996, but has been seen in other groups that uh, in addition to schwannomas, which occur in 100% of patients with schwannomatosis, meningiomas, meningiomas can occur, but at much lower rates. So I want to now give you um, what is the largest study uh, of the clinical phenotype of schwannomatosis, meaning what do we actually see in the clinic. We reviewed the records of 87 patients seen at MGH who met criteria for schwannomatosis. 
and the median age or the average age at which patients first uh, described symptoms was age 30. And I'll just note that this is much later than, the, than for either NF1 or NF2. The median age of diagnosis was 40 years, and you can see that the difference between 30 and 40 years shows you how long the delay uh, it, it is for patients to get diagnosed. And I think people often ask why that is. In NF1, people get diagnosed because of what's on their skin, and that's quite easy for clinicians to identify. That is the cafe macules and the skin fold freckling. In NF2, patients lose hearing, and so those patients come to a medical attention early. In schwannomatosis, usually it's either a lump or a bump, which often may not get biopsy, or more commonly pain, which is uh, often very slow to be diagnosed, usually blamed on back pain or sciatica. And so there's a reason it takes so long to diagnose. Um, in our series, like in the international series, about 13 to 15 percent of patients have a family history. <clears throat> and about 41 percent of patients presented with a mass, 27 percent with a painless mass, meaning just a lump without any symptoms, um, and about 11 percent had pain associated with the mass and 2% of patients were identified just because it, their tumor was found incidentally during imaging. Now when you look, when you do MRI scans of the brain and spine, what we saw in our patients was that um, non-vestibular cranial schwannomas, meaning schwannomas inside the skull but not affecting the hearing nerve, were identified in about 8% of patients. Meningiomas in our series uh, uh, of individuals was identified in about 5% of patients. So unlike NF2, where 50% of patients have meningiomas, um, it's about 5% in, in our series of patients with schwannomatosis. Um, and if you looked at individuals who had spine MRIs performed, um, spinal schwannomas were common, about 3 quarters of patients. And when you looked at MRIs in the rest of the body, peripheral schwannomas, which means schwannomas outside of the brain and spinal cord, so the arm, the leg, the pelvis, things and so forth, were present in virtually all, everybody, so about 90% of individuals. And so what it gives you the sense is the most common, we, the most common location we see are peripheral schwannomas, followed by spinal schwannomas, followed by intracranial schwannomas, and the least, the least common were the meningiomas. Now, one thing that's very common is that patients have lots of surgery schwannomatosis, and when we went back and looked at our records, 86 of our patients, so that's 86 of 87, a patient had surgery, and it was 217 surgeries that we looked at. Um, in our patients, it was an average of two surgeries per patient, but some patients had had as many as nine surgeries. Um, when we went back and looked at what happened after surgery, we were struck by how many people had problems after surgery. And you can see of the 40 people who had spine surgery, about half of them had persistent problems after spine surgery. And about a quarter of people had persistent problems after surgery for a peripheral schwannoma. And for me, this highlights the importance of finding very experienced surgeons who know precisely how to take out these tumors because there's a, 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 a big risk uh, with an inexperienced surgeon that uh, patients can come out with uh, problems even when they went in feeling pretty good. Pain is the, really the most common symptom that's reported by patients and in our group of patients it was almost 70 percent of patients and what's interesting it includes both local pain and multifocal so many spots are diffuse pain and uh, in our group, again, uh, almost 20% of patients were completely disabled by their pain, meaning that they were on disability and couldn't work. Pain is the reason that most people get surgery. So of our patients who got surgery, 80% of the time it was for pain. And what was a little surprising um, was that local pain was completely relieved in less than half, in less than half of surgery. So if you have surgery, you have pain in your right arm, it goes away about 40% of the time, which means that 60% of the time, local pain is not completely relieved after surgery. And even more worrisome is that the pain recurred in most patients uh, either at the site of the original tumor or due to a new tumor. And so while surgery certainly has a very important role in taking care of patients with schwannomatosis, uh, I don't think that surgery alone is completely effective for all of our patients. 
So if you don't do surgery, what do you do? You do pain medicines, and most patients in our group had used medications for chronic pain, uh, three out of five, um, and many had used uh, multiple medications. The most number of medications used was 15 different medications in a single individual. Now one thing we talk about a lot is what's the risk of cancer in schwannomatosis? We know that in NF type 1 there's a 10% lifetime risk of cancer. In NF2 we think there's virtually a 0% risk of cancer unless people get radiation. So should patients with uh, schwannomatosis worry about it? Well, uh, unfortunately I can't give you a definitive answer today. We know that um, that uh, we, we have seen many patients, not many, we've seen three patients at MGH who were diagnosed with a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, which is the cancerous form of a, of a schwannoma. Uh, and that when we reviewed the pathology, these were revised in all three cases. Um, they were, were revised really to be other types of cancers in two of the cases. They were melanomas, and in one case were, were revised to be a, a, a type of benign schwannoma. So, um, at this point in, at Mass General Hospital, we haven't um, convincingly seen um, uh, cases of, of malignancy related to Schwann, that, that I'm sure is related to schwannomatosis, but I think it's important to know that other groups um, have seen uh, MPNSTs, at least as far as they know, and so at this time I counsel my patients that it's something we should probably look for, although we don't have convincing evidence that it's related. Um, so I wanted, I, I do have some extra slides which I'll show you uh, in, in a second. I just wanted to say that um, where are we heading uh, in schwannomatosis? Well, um, through funding through the Department of Defense and other groups, um, we do now have mouse models of schwannomatosis that are helping us understand what causes schwannomas to grow uh, and also what is causing the pain in schwannomatosis and there's a lot of interest in developing clinical trials um, for humans to see if we can treat patients with schwannomatosis. And I think it's important to note that there is now an international, international registry of schwannomatosis that's been created. Um, it's run out of Johns Hopkins uh, by Amanda Bergner, uh, um, and, uh, and that's uh, going to be an excellent resource for the international research community moving forward. I wanted to um, since I have about maybe 10 minutes left, uh, I guess, Kim, how much time should we leave for questions? Um, well, we have a few that have rolled in here now. So um, go ahead and take the time that you need, Dr. Parkins, and then, then we'll um, just take the questions that you have time to take this evening. No, why, why don't, if it's okay, why don't I take a few now uh, just to make sure I haven't lost anybody. And if people are interested, um, what I'll do is I'll finish up talking about our experience using whole body MRI scans to, um, to look at internal tumors in patients with schwannomatosis. So why don't we just take a few questions then? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read them, and I, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing some of these things correctly. This is a mother with spinal schwannoma identified with NF2 and the Smart B1 alterations. One daughter with two small spinal schwannomas. Question um, with one vestibular schwannoma, one trigminal schwannoma, one menginoma, one spinal schwannoma. Currently part of an NF2 study at NIH. Maternal grandfather with presumed large spinal schwannoma. Blood examined. No genetic for NF2 or the Smart B1 detected in blood. Um, that was a lot of information. Sweet. Uh, so they, they, keep going. She's continuing to write on here. You want me to keep, oh. help me get all this out here? Yeah. Uh, no tumor the, the, removed yet from the questioner. Are there research studies for people like me? I live in the San Francisco Bay Area of California. Lots of pain in tongue presumed to be coming from that trigminal tumor. Severe. I'm going to tell pain. D-Y-S-G-E-U-S-I-A, presumed to be from Chordia Tipania. Nothing has helped these. Okay, that's all that she has to say. <laughs> that was really complicated. Um, I think the central question, though, was whether there's a research study available. Is that right, Kim? Yes, I believe so. 
you know, maybe the, the person who had the question can let me know, uh, is this a study meaning looking for a drug treatment or are you looking for a study to participate um, in a research study that helps us understand more about schwannomatosis? Okay. If Fran could type an answer to Dr. Podkin's question, then I'll go ahead and, and read it. Um, are there um, any studies for people to participate in schwannomatosis that have um, clinical benefits yet? So to, to, to my knowledge at this point, there are no open clinical trials of medications to treat these tumors, although I, I will say that um, I, I think these will be happening in the next year or two. I know a lot of groups are interested, and I think one of the challenges we face is um, the mouse models are so new that it's been hard to get enough data available to bring to the drug companies to get the drug companies to, con to commit. Um, the resources to participate in this. So I think the answer is not quite yet for a clinical treatment trial. I do think that there are a lot of uh, research trials going on where patients can um, either give blood samples to look for genes that are involved in schwannomatosis or to participate. You know, we, we for example, at MGH have a trial of uh, resiliency training to help people with the stress and worry of schwannomatosis. Um, those are trials um, that people can participate in, but they're not treatment trials. Um, and this is another question here. Is there any sense as to whether non-painful schwannomatosis can, as it develops, start to cause pain beyond the compression of the non-related tissue and nerves, specifically referring to schwannomas in the region of the brachial plexus? Read that one more time. The question is, uh, uh, is say one more. As to whether the non-painful schwannomas can, as it develops, start to cause pain. Oh, yeah. I mean, can they, can they transition from being not painful to painful? I think the answer is clearly yes. But what I would underscore is we're, we're struggling. Um, the doctors and the researchers are struggling to understand what causes the pain. One would think, for example, that the pain is caused because a tumor is growing on a nerve and a nerve can be painful. The problem is we, we know, and I just showed you some of the data that even when you have a pain, let's say in your right leg, people can have diffuse or multifocal pain with schwannomatosis. Um, and so we've moved away from having a very kind of concrete uh, idea that a local tumor causes a local problem and we're trying to think more broadly. Maybe there's some underlying problem with pain sensitivity in this condition. Maybe, um, maybe there's something secreted by the tumors that can be throughout the body. And so um, I would say that uh, tumors can go from asymptomatic, no symptoms, to symptomatic with pain. We don't know why that transition happens. And often, when we monitor patients in clinic, the number one thing we do at our yearly visit is to ask people, how's their pain, any new pain? Because if they do have new pain, it'll lead to imaging, which can hopefully identify tumors. Okay, thank you. Let me ask Stephen's questions here. Is, it, is there any evidence to suggest that hormonal changes or stress can trigger an increase in growth activity of schwannomas? Um, I would say there's no evidence. The question was, is there evidence? I think there's anecdotes, and, um, and most of that anecdote comes from the NF1 world, uh, less so from the NF2 world. Um, so there's, in my mind, no direct evidence. Having said that, uh, I'll tell you that I, I, I believe firmly and without question that all of us um, uh, have a close interaction between how much pain we experience and our mood, anxiety, and stress. And what I mean by that is, if you're in a lot of pain, that often will make people anxious and depressed. But being anxious and depressed makes the pain worse, and this is a cycle that just reinforces itself. It becomes very difficult to help somebody when they're in a lot of pain and their life is really a mess. Um, they can't, maybe can't work, maybe they can't enjoy themselves. Um, and so uh, I don't think it's like a tumor growing, but I think that stress can make symptoms worse really through a psychological aspect. Um, can I ask a follow-up question on that? Is, when, sure. With, with the um, pain management clinics that are around the country, are, are the people with schwannomatosis finding some relief at these clinics? 
Is that your question or a question from? Yes. Yeah. Uh, as your, so it's a great question. <clears throat> so uh, I guess I'll tell you what I really think. So I, I think that pain clinics are absolutely essential because <laughs> because they're really the the experts at the different medications. And I would say that a minority of patients with schwannomatosis really get good pain relief from medicines. I'll give you my own personal bias, and I can't speak for other doctors, that even though a minority of patients really get good benefit from medicines, I think the majority don't get really good benefit. They can live with it, but not great benefit. And so personally, I've been moving away from two, three, four medicines at a time and really moving towards a lot of mind-body treatments in addition to pain medicine, so it's not one or the other, but you do them together because if you can control the stress, anxiety, and worry that comes with schwannomatosis, it's not that you can completely get rid of the pain, but you can really get much more in control. So my own personal view now is I do send people to pain clinic, and then I also send them to our Mind Body Institute um, to, to do work, you know, that we have a very special schwan um, neurofibromatosis, schwannomatosis team that helps patients deal with uh, all the stress. Well, thank you very much. And this, this next one is from Richard. He says, I have multiple right ear schwannomas removed with no hearing loss. Three surgeries since about 30 years old. And most recently had a meningioma brain tumor removed. Do I have NF2? Well, that's a that's a great question. He said right ear, and it doesn't. It's not clear to me whether it's the right vestibular nerve, which is what we think about NF2, or, for example, in a different location near. And you, he may be one of the people where can either have a, a mild form of NF2 or schwannomatosis. And I think I mentioned a, a couple of places where um, we um, haven't known the doctors. And what I recommend for people like this is to go to a clinic where they have experience doing the genetic analysis because if you look for an NF2 gene change in blood and if you find it, by definition you have NF2. And if you find an, an, a SMRCB1 gene change in blood, by definition you have um, schwannomatosis. Now there are some people where the blood tests are negative for both genes and those are the individuals where it's harder to figure out. But for somebody who's had three surgeries, and if we assume that they're three different tumors, you can take the three tumors, send them to a, a laboratory. They can look at the NF2 gene and, and the SMARCB1 gene in the three tumors and figure out whether an individual has NF2 or schwannomatosis. So I think the answer is, um, at least from the little information we have, it, it's likely that some, you can figure this out, what, which, which form of NF you have. Um, he typed in a follow-up uh, question, Dr. Parkins. He says, mm -hmm. when there is a confirmed familiar schwannomatosis, at what age does Dr. Parkins look at testing children? Another great question. So uh, assuming that we know a, a parent has schwannomatosis, um, again, this is a kind of a personal decision um, in, in terms of way doctors practice and, and also the way we work with patients. I'll say, the first thing that I tell my patients is to say, if I had a cure for schwannomatosis, I would test everybody the first moment I met them because you would never want to delay a treatment if you knew it could cure somebody. However, NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis, none of them are curable in 2012. And so there is a question of what's the, what, what good do we do by diagnosing somebody, let's say, 10 years before they become symptomatic? I would argue that in schwannomatosis, there's not very much use if somebody has absolutely no symptoms. And so it, it, it really becomes a discussion with the family. Some families really feel strongly that they want to know this genetic information. It might be because um, somebody's getting married or willing to, wants to start a family and having that genetic information will be helpful. Um, some families don't want to know that. So I, what we try to do is to individualize it based on whether somebody's having symptoms or not um, and, and why people want to know. Certainly, um, by a certain age, usually in the 20s or 30s people or 40s, people do want to know. 
Um, and so we try to stay in touch with people and guide them at our yearly meetings to say, well, is this the year that we want to do testing or do we want to wait some more? And I have a question here now from Megan, but I think we might have to ask her for some follow-up information. She says, I suspect I have schwannomatosis. I plan to get a biopsy early next year to confirm. Located in neck, arms, shoulders, back, and pelvis. Should I expect these tumors to grow? I don't really, can you? Yeah, that's good. Me? That's a great question. I would say that it's a real minority of tumors that grow. Um, and I would just caution it by saying that we don't have great follow-up. Um, and I think that this is what we try to individualize for patients is, to, is to, to try to figure out how often should we be getting MRIs. I usually start off getting an MRI once a year for a few years just to see if a tumor is growing. I would say, again, that the vast majority don't, but occasionally some do. Um, and really, the, you, you, you have to find a doctor who's going to follow you over the long term um, who can monitor you periodically and, and help you figure that out. And then actually Fran um, wanted to follow up just a little bit here, and I think this is the last one that I see typed up here. And, and just saying that he is interested in um, the clinical and the research trial. So if you have some, um, Dr. Plotkins, I'd be glad to e email out um, any information, the one that you're doing there at MGH, um, and any other trials. If you'd like to give me the links to the information, I would um, get it out. Sure, we'll, we'll be happy to help you kind of pull together, like the International Schwannomatosis Database is a way we're trying to um, organize people so that, let's say, when a drug trial becomes available, we'll have a couple hundred names we can inform people. There's a lot of genetic studies going on and so forth. Okay, I'll be happy to do that. Do people want to hear uh, about five minutes on whole body MRI scans or do you think we should call it quits? Um, we'd be glad to do five minutes on the whole body MRI um, and if, other, if they have to leave they can go ahead and drop off. Uh, Megan just typed in one question that I think you can answer really quickly. The Mind Body Institute at Mass General She's um, wanting to know, is, is it in New York? The location of that, can you tell Megan? Yeah, that's, the, that's certainly easy. No, we're located in Boston. And um, yeah, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're located in Boston. And unfortunately, when it comes to mind-body medicine, um, you really have to um, show up and be present. It's not something you do through, for example, through the internet or by phone, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. And let's go ahead and move on to the whole body MRI. Okay. So very quickly, um, we, we spent the last few years looking at um, what whole body MRI can teach us about identifying tumors in NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. And so I'll tell you briefly about 250 subjects that we've uh, studied. Um, and just to say that a whole body MRI uses a standard 1.5 Tesla magnet. So that means the regular MRI that is in it pretty much every hospital in North America, patients lie on their back, that's supine, and you put your arms by your side, as you can see here. And the trick is there's a body coil, that's, that's a piece of machinery inside the MRI scan that's integrated, meaning it, integrate, it can be integrated from the head, the neck, and the shoulders, and so forth. And we image people in five stations. The head and neck is one, the chest is another, the pelvis is the third, the thighs are the fourth, and the legs are the fifth. And then there's very few sequences, so, we, so in order to do this quickly, we cut down on how much detail we get. It only takes about 35 to 45 minutes. And then when you get this information, these are examples of tumors, and we define tumors as either being discrete, so they have um, sharp boundaries, or plexiform, which means indistinct boundaries, and uh, we had a, a board-certified radiologist divide tumors that way. And then we have a very nifty thing that was written by Wenlei Chai, who's a brilliant computer scientist at MGH, where you can use a computer to automatically measure the size of a tumor. And you can see on the bottom panel, panel here how you have a 3D rendering of the tumor that grows as the computer does loops, iterations, loops on, on this um, to try to measure it quickly. And the reason this is so important, if you're measuring tumors throughout the body, if you did this by hand, it would take you, let's say, one or two days per scan. A computer can do it in a matter of minutes. 
And then when you, we look to see, um, when you look at the computer volumes versus the human volumes, there's a very good correlation. And this shows you that the computers can, in fact, do some of the work for us. So I'll just say that we, we um, had 282 scans, including 51 patients with schwannomatosis and 11 patients who were the children of patients with schwannomatosis that we did whole body MRI scans on. This is an example of some schwannomatosis patients, um, and you can see it's all anonymous. Um, everything in red is a tumor. So you can see that here's a patient with schwannomatosis, patient 103, who has tumors really in every part of the body and multiple tumors. Here's patient 3 who has one in the right neck, the right shoulder, the right arm, in the kind of abdomen, left leg, right leg, but much less tumor burden. Here is an individual who has bigger tumors, more like patient 103, but they're not what they're really focused in the trunk. And here's a patient who has very focused tumors just in one area where there's not a lot of distribution. And then a few more examples showing how widespread um, you can see one down here in the leg, all the way up here, but nothing on the right side. And you can see the rest of the examples here. So we had 51 patients. The average age was 48 years. Um, and as I told you, the age of diagnosis was um, around 40. Half were male, half were female of our patients. And like I've told you before, about 15% had a family, 15% of patients had a family history, 80% didn't. Now, when you did a whole body MRI scan, 71% of these 51 patients had an internal tumor uh, on whole body MRI scan, including 14% uh, who had a plexiform tumor, and I told you that was the one with indistinct boundaries, 65% of whom had a discrete tumor. And schwannomatosis patients were, were, had the highest percentage uh, of tumors, that is 71% in schwannomatosis, only 60% um, of NF1 patients or 45% of NF2 patients, so um, even more likely in schwannomatosis. The average number of tumors in an individual was four. You can see the upper range was 27. And the average tumor volume is about 40 mils. Um, and the increasing tumor volume was correlated with increasing age. So it wasn't a perfect correlation, but basically this suggests to us that um, it might be that tumor volume does increase with time. And this is a comparison here but, uh, of specifically the plexiform tumors, which tend to be the ones that are really difficult to remove surgically, between uh, NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. And you can see that the tumors in schwannomatosis are much smaller than the tumors in either NF1 or NF2. So let's see. I think, I think that's where I'll stop. Um, I'll just maybe close on uh, an example of a family tree for people who have seen these types of family trees before. And you can see that um, the, when you're filled in, that means you have schwannomatosis. And here's a family where a father and a man, a man is a square, so a father and a son both have schwannomatosis. And you can see that uh, on the side of the family over here, so the affected father's sister, so the woman is a circle, she doesn't have any signs, um, but their child does. Uh, who has a single schwannoma. And so this is what we say that there's incomplete penetrance where even though somebody um, is affected and has the gene, um, may not show signs. So I think I'll, I'll stop there and, and to suggest that for me, whole body MRI scan is an emerging technique for schwannomatosis. I personally feel um, that this technique should be done in patients when they're first diagnosed or in the diagnosis process so that we can have um, an understanding of whether tumors affect the peripheral system, you know, outside the brain and spinal cord. Um, I will say, just for the sake of disclosure, that many uh, physicians don't share the belief that patients should have a whole body, scan, whole body MRI scan up front because it can reveal a lot of abnormalities that may not be important, and those abnormalities can make people worried. But I do think that in the future, we're going to try to incorporate this into the clinical care of patients with schwannomatosis. And so I'll stop there, and maybe we'll see if there's any more questions. And if not, we'll call it a night. Well, actually, Dr. Parkins, we don't have oh, one just rolled.
No, nope, that's it. There aren't any more questions um, this evening. So what I'd like to do is thank you very much for your presentation um, this evening. And um, oh, I do see people asking questions now, asking if we can share the presentation um, and get that information out. And yes, this presentation will be available on the website um, in just a couple of days. You'll be able to go to the nfnetwork.org um, and view the, the webinar. And then we'll get that information about um, those clinical trials um, out to everybody in email. So again, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Parkins, again, for a wonderful webinar this evening and for everybody attending, and say good night.